Yeah. Well, listen, let's, let's, let's make the transition to the fall. And then I got some questions here from, uh, from the audience that aren't necessarily season specific. But um, who wants to take a shot then to say, listen, come fall time, how would you change things up? What would you do different? What tools would you use different? What locations would be different? I like Calgo. Uh, you know, we find they almost mimic what they do in the springtime. They, they go right back to almost the same areas. They're in a little shallower. They're into that dark water. Um, and, you know, we, we, we go back to uh, a bigger lure, but we slow it right down again. It's, it just comes down to water temperature. And if you can present a very appetizing meal in front of them real slow, it's really hard for them to resist. Um, but, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you have to fish where the fish are. And, you know, we, we've got really good at following them, especially in the fall. And they're, they're creatures of habit. And they're always in the same spot year after year after year. Every year, the lure might change just a little bit, or the color. Something seems to work a bit better, but for the most part, um, they, they almost go right back to their same spring spots. Awesome, Colin. What are your thoughts? Uh, agree with what Kyle's saying. A uh, couple things is that I find in the early part of the fall, it's almost like gentleman's fishing. Uh, you get those warm, and by that I mean you get to sleep in. You don't have to be out there at the crack of dawn, and you don't have to stay out till dark. Because I find it's like this window from about 10 o'clock to about 3 o'clock, depending upon where we are in the equinox. But when the sun's out or it's a warmer day and it's cold at night, there's this window when they're on. And then once you get past that window, and it could be 3 or 4 o'clock, and it's still sunny out at 5 or 6, but they're done. They just shut down. Because the temperatures drop, the sun's kissing the tops of the trees now, and they just stop biting. I, I've seen this with bass. I've seen it with a number of other species in the fall. Again, that's late September going into October. Um, as Kyle mentioned, slow. Really slow it down. I'm using sink tip lines. I'm using weighted flies. I'm putting it near the bottom. Um, I will say that it, you have to play with it a bit. Unlike the spring where I was talking about using smaller flies at, and slower presentations, often sometimes I need to use bigger flies still because they're trying to maximize the number of calories that they're inhaling each time. So if they're going to expend energy to eat something, they're still trying to do a bigger food. And, and that applies to musky around here. You got to throw big chickens in, but you just got to go slow. But when we get to the real lake, I mean, we're just about to have ice and it's cold. The, the, all the cabbage beds are dead. There's nothing around them. Um, then I'm going to go the small, like these black flies. This, this one, the Northern Magic. They seem to work six inches, four inches, black, purples, uh, olives, real slow near the bottom. They're not gonna be chasing bait fish. When I throw these things, I might get the little guys, but if I'm hunting the big ones, slow and near the bottom. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty efficient feeders come fall. What, uh, what's your thoughts on, uh, on body weight? Here's a question, you know, like how, What's the weight difference between the same fish in the spring versus you catch that same fish in the fall? Kyle, can you notice it? Oh, definitely. They, they've definitely um, got some girth to them going into the fall. Um, it's, it's no comparison. You, know, a, you can tell a post-spawn female in the springtime that she's spawned out and she's um, kind of thready. But it doesn't take long for them, and, and you know you just can't. You just you just shocked at the size of it because there's a lot of girth to it. You can you know almost not get your hands around them to grab it. But yeah, it's uh, it's very noticeable um, late fall how much weight they've actually put on getting ready for winter. Here's a here's a question from uh, from a fellow named Rich, and what Rich wants to know is your favorite lure. He wants the he wants the the specific recipe here, guys. Favorite lure, color, and size for mid-September trolling in a tea-stained lake. I got something for Rich, I think, right here. <laughs> big, big fire tank. Is that a flatfish? It is, yeah. We, uh, I have a whole, well, let's have a look here. I have, you oh, can see on that, but. There's no shortage of lure um, from flies to, you know, it's just a, a, a small a fraction of what we have. So, I mean, I have, I don't know, I, I don't even know how much tackle I have. I got a lot of big stuff. And later on in the year, we, 
to tow all the big stuff around. And, you know, those line through trouts are great. Anything in a perch pattern. But, uh, yeah, that one's, that one's for Rich. All right. So that, I think that's that would a... be uh, the fire tagger in the fall. It's a bright color. Um, and it's, it's got a, a rattle inside it, so it, it's going to make some noise. So sometimes in the fall we find the, tea, uh, the water gets a little darker than uh, any other time of the year. And that brighter color seems to attract them quite a bit. Cool. Colin, what, what, are, you, what are your thoughts there on uh, Rich's question? Uh, this is uh, the, the, the first time I think Colin and I don't agree uh, because he said tea stained, uh, tannic water yep. uh, or muddy. And it, uh, my experience, it doesn't matter if it's Labrador or in Saskatchewan or, or Northern Ontario, when you get that tea colored water, I find black and orange, black, 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 purple, dark colors, big silhouette. They just, they can see it. They can find it easier sunny or overcast. Black seems to work really well. And especially if you can get it like this one's a smaller one, but black and orange, I seems to work. Now, again, this is based on the stain. If it was clear water, I'd have a different opinion, but definitely in stained water in that late September, black, I go with black and orange. Yeah, I, you know, I get it. I've had a lot of success with darker baits and you know, some of the guys I fish with, and I've often thought it's because if the fish is looking up, that contrast with the dark body, that's what they're looking at. The contrast, like it's creating a shadow versus the sky and the light. Um, I've, I've done real well. I've, I've done real well fishing walleye on dark baits uh, in tea stained water. So this isn't about walleye, but I thought I'd throw it out there. Uh, here's a question here, which is, well, this isn't so much about um, catching big, feist, big pike, it's about handling big pike. So thoughts on netting versus hand landing, and if netting, is there a size or style of net you, le you like to use? You want me to go first, Kyle? Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a really good question. And uh, first off, let me just say, before I answer about the big fish, all my problems I ever have with pike are little fish. Yeah. If something's gonna slice my hand up or put hooks into me, it's a little guy. So they're the ones I'm usually the most cautious with. Um, the big fish, I, I'm so worried about hurting them. I've got, I bought a big fray bill net that's used for muskie. And I actually bring it into the lodges now, wherever we go. I've used the cradle, but I've lost too many good fish bringing them in the cradle. And it just takes that pause of guys not paying attention and they squirt out the end with, you don't expect them, they do a little kick. Um, so I'm a big fan of using a big net like that, keeping them at the side. I've actually got some uh, uh, big rings we put around that are floaters that, to make sure it doesn't sink. And we can unhook the fish, keep it there, um, and, and even lift it up and get a picture, especially if you've got a friend in another boat, come over and you're not paying the fish vertical, which there's a lot of, you know, people who have got different opinions about it, but I, I, I just err on the safety side. You know these big fish are generally females. They're the ones that are carrying a, the, 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 the whole future of that lake or river, and you don't want to hurt them. So if I catch them, I try to keep them in the net, line them with the net, and, I sp and as anybody knows, those Frayville nets, and there's other manufacturers, they're made not to hurt them, whether it's the way that the netting's made, they're deep enough, they're big enough, even if they're bouncing around a bit, they don't tear up their jaw. If you got hooks and stuff like that, they're just easier to manage the fish. Keep them in the, the, the net at the side, lift it up, get your pitcher, and then just let them slide out. And I don't hurt the fish. Kyle? I, I agree. We, um, we use both. Um, we, I was a fan of the cradle, but you're right. If you have a, a bad cradleman or somebody that's not experienced with it, it uh, you can lose some fish that way. And I, I know a lot of people do, um, but the joy of the cradle is there's, there's two, two bonuses to it. It, it fully, uh, when you lift that fish out of the water, you can work on it over the side of the boat. You can keep it in the water and it's, uh, it's really good for keeping hooks out of people. Um, because if they if you bring them into the boat sometimes and they're outside of that they're they're flopping around the bottom of the boat and you can damage the fish and hurt them that way it's one of the reasons why i like the cradle because it really you can control them a little better um but i've never used a big musky net like colin's talking about so you know it's something to try 
down the future in the future down the road uh, you know i mean as long as nobody whatever method you're using as long as nobody is damaging the fish and you can release them safely and you know keep the those genes in the water because we know that you know big fish breed big fish and we wanted those that gene pool to you know kind of go on forever and that's the most important thing yeah yeah you know colin you know you're talking about the, the cradle the, the issue i've actually had with the cradle and, and i have cradles um but I've lost a number of fish, unfortunately, because when the, when, if you don't get the, the net underneath the head, and if there's any hook hanging out, I've had to catch the, catch the exposed barb on the way in, and you can pretty much say goodbye at that point. Because yeah. either that fish is getting off, or it's going to get so tangled that you want it to get off as quickly as possible so it doesn't get hurt. Yeah, that's another reason why I try to... If I'm fishing the big pike, I, I have a pair of cutters, just like the musky guys do, and I, write, I get in there and I cut the hook. I'm just yeah. not going to hurt the fish yeah. because it of that be. reason. Yeah. Could I uh, jump in here, if you don't mind, and just I want to bring up a couple points about, because it's related to what we're talking about for catch and release. Um, and, uh, and, and I didn't want to stay at the top, and everyone thinks that fly fishing are all about catch and release. No, I, I, I just said it before. I'll, if I'm going to keep a couple to eat, I like those little five to six pounders, seven pounders. They've got a nice amount of meat, very firm. And if you keep a couple of those, they don't have the impact on the ecosystem like the big monsters do. So I always let those go, they're, they're really important. But going to that, one of the things that shocks some people in fly fishing is that, one of the things that I learned was that, you know how you get the pike and they've got those massive jaws? And I'm talking the ones, Kyle, you know the ones with, it looks like a shovel that their head it's like and their eyes are way over here and when they sometimes when they come at you following a fly or a lure it scares you they're so big right and menacing looking i've had a number of them with big pike or big musky where i'm using a single hook and they i'm pulling it back like this if i can show this right and that pike comes up there and it goes and smacks it down real hard well that fly if i can show this to you lays flat I do, a, I, I do a pull to strip set the hook and lift up and there's feathers laying all over the surface and I've lost that big fish. I'm like, what the heck happened? And it's because they turned it on its side. I don't realize it. And unless that pipe turns away from me and it slides into the corner of the mouth, I don't get them. So I got taught something by a guy who was really, he'd, he'd experienced the same thing I did. I've got this one on a fly. It's all beat up here. It's called the quarter chicken dinner. It's a great fly made by Steve May. It looks better. This one's caught literally hundreds of pike, and I still use it. But I don't know if you can see it. I have a treble hook on there. So okay. it's got a single hook here, and then you use a piece of surgical tubing to put a treble hook on. The treble hook, the key to this, I've got all the barbs off. They're all flattened down, or I buy the, 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 the barbless ones. You put that on there with this hook, and what happens is when they do that big crush, and they smoke the fly and it goes sideways, you still have that treble. And when I do this strip set, I find 90% of the time they're in the corner of the mouse. So the next thing logically is then, well, what happens, Call, when you catch those little, you know, tw 24 inches or 20 inches that have a propensity to eat it and take it deep. Again, barbless treble hooks. I have the long nose pliers, I just go down, whoop, comes right out. Never have a problem getting those out. Never have a problem. I've never heard of fish using the trebles and I stopped losing big fish as an angler because I've got lots of big flies here where, you know, they're, they're wonderful patterns, but they've got that single hook. And that's, I've had too many big fish, especially musky. So if I'm going for those 40 inch plus pipe and they have that big shovel head and they real bony in there, I won't get the purchase unless I have the treble hook and it doesn't hurt them. And if anything, like I said, I have the cutters and I can snap it right off if there is any problems. But I've never even had to use them, not once. That's an awesome tip. Real good tip. So listen, boys, we're coming up to, uh, you know, it's about 7.50. Why don't we, why don't we go with this? Any, any final thoughts that you think that we should cover? Any, any general tips for catching big pike? Use your seasons, use your technique. Kyle, why don't we start with you? Anything that you wanted to add or we didn't cover? Uh, consistency and confidence. You, you have to be out there and you have to be confident that you know what you're doing. And I mean, confidence goes a long ways. You have to have lures that you know work and you have to be fishing where fish are. Um, 
and that that's really the biggest thing is really you know being out there putting putting the hours in and you know eventually you're you're going to connect with them um can't catch them on the couch awesome book your trip today yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, you know, I've often. I, I guess I, I missed that. All, I missed the chance. There, yeah. <laughs> but you know, the, the you know the best weeks at those camps go for a reason because the people know it's you know it's sometimes the best fishing. But um, Colin, what, you, you got want to add anything in there? Any general? Oh, thoughts? I got I got lots. If you don't mind, give me two minutes. I got so, time. a couple things. So Kyle, you said something absolutely right. Here I am. I've got big fly boxes full of flies. I've got another one over there. I've got piles of them here. I haven't even shown anybody. And I always get them. I go to the, these fly fishing shows and I buy these flies or I see new pattern time. Everything comes out the same thing. I've got my five or six confidence flies. Yeah. And I always go back to them. Yeah, I like to play with the new ones, but you, you build this, this feeling, you know how to use it, you know how to retrieve it, you know the right depth to do it, the way to work it, moving the rod tip. Every, you just, you get in the zone. And I have that, whether it's for fishing for trout or it's these big pike, it's the same thing. Um, next thing I just want to talk quickly is that about the rig. A lot of people think that fly fishing is complicated and fly fishing is not complicated. You can make it as complicated as you want. And I know a lot of people who like to catch big pike, that's how they got into uh, fly fishing was doing that. There's some places to throw in spinners and they want a little more challenge. Let me tell you, you catch a big pike or even a medium sized pike on a fly, it's like sex for your arm. It's just so much fun. You really feel the fight, you feel the runs, you feel the hit. It's just so much fun. And going to that, the easiest thing, you've got your floating line, you've got your sink tip, whatever it is, but say I'm gonna talk about a floating line, which you're gonna use probably in most pike places about, I'd say 70 to 80% of the time. What I've got here is six feet, I use six to eight feet of 50 pound mono. This is trilene, and you can see it's very stiff. Loop to loop, to your fly line, and then to that, a piece of bite wire and I've got about 24 inches here going to the fly. I'm using, uh, this is Rio uh, bite wire. You can use the fixed, you know, everyone sees those ones you buy with the clips that you can get a Canadian tire or wherever you're placing and they're seven or nine strand wire. They'll work but they're really not fun to cast. What you want here is this, the soft wire because it'll move and it won't impair the action of the fly. So again, the same thing, that wire, loop to loop and what happens is is you're cutting back and you're changing flies when it gets too short you just unloop it tie in another loop of of this stuff 18 to 24 inches and you're back in action and i don't know school this is like 15 dollars but the key is no matter what product you use i like the supple 30 40 pound wires i've never lost a muscular pike using the system i have lost them trying to use straight fluorocarbon. I know some of the musky anglers like to use the 80 pound fluorocarbon. I've seen them cut it. You get them the wrong place, the wrong way, they will cut it. I like seven or nine strand wire. I don't lose fish. This is easy to cast. It's easy to change. I'm into simple. Simple is fun, especially when I'm cold. <laughs> hey, listen, Colin, we've got another question here that's it's right up your alley here. It's again, it's, it's very specific. Ideal rod and fly line to use in the Georgian Bay Honey Harbor area? Okay, good, good question. I'm a big fan of, uh, first of all, it, uh, I like using nine or, ten rod, eight, nine or 10 weight rods. And the reason why it's not about the size of the fish, it's about the size of the flies. You wanna have a lot of power. And the nice thing is if you get one of these nine or 10 weight rods, you've got the versatility to use it for salt water and other species, big species. You want fast action, and in terms of the line, it's not about the brand, and um, there's lots of good companies out there that make different fly lines. We're, we deal with scientific anglers, uh, we dealt with Rio, but it's more about the head. They now make fly lines, floating fly lines, that are specific to pike and muskie. And what they have is a very short head, which helps you load the line easier and cast big wind-resistant flies like this, especially this one's a rabbit strip. So it's gonna be carrying a bit of water, but even if I'm throwing, uh, let me find a bigger fly here. Like here, there's a rat pattern. And this throws off water, but it's wind resistant. And I've got, I could be on Kyle's Lake there, punching it into the wind, putting it on top of the cabbage beds. If I've got a nine or 10 weight, I can really punch that fly out. So 
to answer the question, nine or 10 weight rods, fast action, and I would get the floating pike or musky taper. The shorter the head and thicker it is, the better. And if you're gonna be in that region, uh, you're gonna have the pike go deeper in the middle of summer and early September. You might wanna get a sink tip and you're looking for a 15 foot sink tip. I would get a type six to get it down. Type six means it's gonna sink at, at five to six inches per second to get that fly. And it doesn't matter what size it is because if you throw weighted flies, it's really difficult. You gotta open your loop and stuff like that. And if you get one in the back of your head, Besides having a few tears in your eye, if you're bat, you, you know, you're unlucky and you got, did with my event, took my advice and put the treble hook on. Now you got to dig that out as well. That's why I really like using uh, sink tips. Let the line do the work for you. You still have to open your loop, but punch it out, count it down, start stripping. Sink tips are wonderful. 15 foot head. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and listen, Kyle, I know you do some fly fishing too. I Full disclosure here, I've never done fly fishing. I And now I have a... I have a good collection of spinning rods, probably more than my spouse would like to know that I have. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what is, if, if someone's just starting, you know, is there a good multi-purpose rod that you could recommend? Again, not brand, but maybe weight? If they're, I guess if they're getting into predator fishing, I, I believe an eight or a nine. Um, I'm a fan of the nine weight just because it's more versatile. Um, and I mean, there's some great fly shops out there that you can go to. And I always tell people that if you're getting into fly fishing, um, buy the best gear that you can afford. Um, just simply because you can go to a fly shop and you can buy somebody traded in a, in a rod and a reel and you can get a, a really quality product that, uh, off the shelf that, you know, isn't coming from, you know, Walmart or Canadian tire that's already got the line on it. Cause you know, the cheaper products are going to make your, uh, your fishing experience not as much fun. So you know, buy the best product or the best gear that you can. And, uh, you know, the fly shops will help you out with, uh, you know, maybe a used setup. And, you know, for me, um, like Colin said, say, I always go with the sink tip, you know, 15 foot sink tip. I think it's 350 grain. And uh, I, I barely ever take that off because the flies that we're using are, you know, like he said, they're basically wet tube socks all the time. And uh, I need that little bit of weight just to sink them subsurface because if you use straight floating line on them they uh they tend to stay on top of the water just want to get them down you know two feet or so okay colin thoughts totally agree uh there are some brands out there i mean I, you know i don't want to play the the brand thing but i will say like obviously we work with orvis and orvis has got a line of rods um and they're two hundred dollars you can get an eight or nine weight rod for $200 and it's got a 25 year warranty. So if you step on it in the boat, it, they'll give you another one. Uh, so if you check with the local fly shop or go to orvis.com, you'll see them in there. But the bottom line is you don't have to spend a lot of money. There are $800 rods, 800 US dollar rods you can buy, but you don't have to do that. You can spend 200 bucks at sale or I think sale carries Orvis and, and obviously fly shops do, but $200 will get you into a great ride. You'll still need to get a reel, but you don't need a big drag system, just a basic reel. Or as uh, Kyle mentioned, look, there's some great deals at some of the places that are trade-ins or on Kijiji's, things like that. Last thing, I know we got one minute here or we're just at the end. I want to show people a fly that I love this fly. It's called the Murdich Minnow, M-U-R-D-I-C-H. Uh, invented by a gentleman down in uh, Michigan, and it's my number one killer pipe pattern right now, and it works everywhere. This one's a perch pattern. It can be white. It can be two-tone, uh, all black with a bit of orange on the bottom. It's super deadly, but the you know, key is, and I don't know if it'll pick it up, I've got, there's a rattle attached to it. So the combination of the rattle, the tail that moves, and it's very lightweight and easy. I can throw this on a six-way rod and not have any problems with it because it sheds the water. It's all synthetic materials. This fly has caught me more pike in the last two years than I can mention. And uh, I actually have it a smaller version. And you were talking about walleye. That's our number one walleye fly, the Murdish Minnow in black with a bit of orange on the bottom. Same thing, it's got a rattle. And I've caught big pike when I'm throwing that. So my daughter caught a 30, 30 inch walleye on this fly. Whoa. I know she beat my, her dad. My biggest was 29 and a half at that point. And she got a legitimate rod in the boat, put against the gunnel, measured 30 and a, 30 and a quarter. It was like all 10, 12 pounds. It was a big walleye a on big that fly. Big yeah. fish. Beauty. 
All right, listen, guys, thank you both for the time tonight. That's a lot of great advice, a lot of great tips. If, uh, and I'll put it in the show notes where you can uh, you know, find more information about these folks. If you want to check out Kyle's Lodge, we have a session there on Meet the Outfitters so you can learn all about Brace Lake Outfitters. Uh, I've had the pleasure of fishing twice up there. Outstanding. Um, and listen, Colin, I didn't know this until recently. I watched your show on Amazon Prime. So I did not know that it's available on Amazon Prime. So, uh, if you can watch it on Amazon Prime, we're on the World Fishing Network in the United States. We're on public television and in Canada. Obviously, a lot of people watch this on YouTube. We're on a bunch of networks, but YouTube's by far become our biggest broadcasters and and uh, broadcasters, excuse me. And if I can just get it on Netflix, everyone will get it. <laughs> All right, listen, thanks so much, everybody, for viewing. And if you're watching this on a recording, I'll make sure that the contact information is in the show notes for you. Thanks very much for everybody joining us. I'm going to stop the live feed now. Mm -hmm.